I loved your book so much, but you make it pretty clear pretty quickly. It's not easy to grow up in Hollywood, is it? Well, no. Uh, <laughs> uh, everybody thinks, oh, you know, it's, uh, it's sunglasses and, and premieres and everything, and, and it isn't. As a matter of fact, as I was growing up, my dad was an assistant director, and it wasn't until uh, I was almost out of high school that he kind of ascended to something uh, a, a bit, quite a bit larger. Uh, but uh, I was just a kid growing up. I had no idea what it was. I didn't know that when... I was four years old and I went on my first movie set that uh, I saw cowboys and Indians and teepees and there were cameras and stuff and a guy asked me to, you know, if I ever been a horse on a horse before and I said no. And he said, you want to go for a ride? Yeah. Somebody picked me up and put me in front of him and I rode around, I don't know, probably two, three minutes. And when I got home that night, my father said to my mother, guess who gave little Howie, that was me, I was little Howie, my father was big Howie. Guess who gave him his first horseback ride? My mother said who, and my father said Clark Gable. Well, to me, I didn't know who Clark Gable was. He was just a <laughs> big guy on a horse. But I loved being on movie sets because that was really the only time I could ever see my dad. And he made what they call B-movies in the 50s. So we didn't take vacations. I went on location whenever it was summer or Christmas or a holiday. And... Actors or big-time directors weren't, weren't anything special to me. They were just part of the family of making movies. And it wasn't until, I guess it was the mid-60s, my dad became head of Paramount. And at Christmas time, um, they moved to a bigger house. I had already moved out. But um, they moved to a bigger house, and in their den that had a pool table and a wet bar... There were so many presents that they went all the way to the ceiling. I'd never seen anything like that from every movie star, every agency, all these things. Well, a couple of years later, when Gulf and Western bought Paramount and my dad was no longer head of Paramount, that room was empty at Christmas time. So uh, I learned kind of early, you know, not to believe every, you know, how much smoke can be blown up somebody's uh, <laughs> behind. So it's, it is feast or famine in, in some ways, I think, for anything that's in the arts, whether it's in theater or film, and you've just articulated that even from one year to the next. Um, I was really struck at times how you grew up, I mean, you grew up right next to Beverly Hills. You know, you were right, sp supposedly in the- Out of district. <laughs> Well, and that's, a, you're beating me. Uh, but yeah, so you're so close and kind of in this world that would appear to be privileged, but in fact, often you kind of had those early experiences of being an outsider, not being let in, you know, and um, how do you think that affected your love for movie making or, or, you know, telling those stories? Because that was really more struggle than we would assume. Well, I, yeah, everybody thinks, you know, my father's was Howard W. Koch Sr., and I was Howard W. Koch Jr., and uh, everybody assumed because my dad was so well-loved in the industry that, oh, it must be easy. Well, it wasn't easy because, number one, he could, if you walked into his office, he could talk to you for four hours. You'd come out and go, what do you mean your father has a hard time communicating? <laughs> Hawk, he's the most wonderful man I've ever met, and yet he couldn't talk to his son. So it was it was a kind of a double-edged sword. I was very proud of who he was, and I loved him, but it was from afar, and I was too afraid to talk, to ask him questions. And he, for some reason, and I may, may have been uh, that generation, couldn't really talk to me. So it was it was it was difficult. You rarely asked your dad for help, actually, when you decided you wanted to be in this profession. Was that a conscious choice? Yeah, I, it was, well, um, I was going to UCLA when John F. Kennedy was assassinated, and I was a huge Kennedy fan, and uh, I left UCLA, and I left the country, and uh, I moved to England, and I got a job in England working with a, a guy who booked uh, American rock acts into England, which was phenomenal, and I kind of moved up very quickly with him, but when I came home, by that time, my dad was head of Paramount, and I did ask him for one job. And he did help me get my first job. And I think not just me, but anybody 
whoever can get you that first in, then you got to prove yourself. And I, he did help me get my first job. And uh, it was on a film called This Property is Condemned, starred Natalie Wood, who was a huge star in 1965, and a young actor in his second film, you may have heard of him, Robert Redford. It was his second film, and not many people knew who Redford was. And uh, I was in the bathroom one day, a couple of weeks into it, and uh, two guys from the crew walked in, and one said to the other, uh, hey, you know, the only reason that that kid, Howard Koch Jr., got the job is because his dad's head of Paramount. And I was crushed because I thought, oh, that's the only reason I'm even here is because of who my dad is. And then the other guy thankfully said, yeah, that's probably how he got the job. He said, but he's doing a hell of a job. He's working his ass off, so why don't you give him a break? And I thought at that moment that I had to work harder than anybody else to prove that it was me, not just because of my father. So that that's that was the time I asked him for that first that first job, and then from then on, I kind of went on my own. And I know that you two never, often, talked about any personal feeling. If you discuss something, it was around the industry. Right. You know, it was something professional. Correct. But there is a moment that you share in the book. Um, I think you even articulated that maybe the most emotional or personal moment that your father ever shared with you and it was in public yeah. <laughs> um, when he received um, the Gene Hirschholt Humanitarian Award. Can you right. tell us about that? The Gene Hirschholt Humanitarian Award is an Oscar given to someone in our industry uh, for a, a life of humanitarian charities doing everything they can for the industry and for people in the industry. And my dad was honored in 1989 with this award. It's an honorary award, it's not given every year. And our whole family was sitting in the audience uh, and he, as he was, uh, Walter Matthau gave him the award and then as he was talking, he talked about each one of his family that was sitting in there and then he said, and I hope one day my son Howard Koch Jr. can be up here on this Oscar stage. And I went, whoa, I mean, I didn't, you know, I didn't know he would say that. And years later, if you look up here at the cover of my book, I was standing, and I always get emotional. Um, you should. I was it's standing amazing. on that Oscar stage uh, in front of 1.3 billion people. Uh, and so my father's hope for me came true. And you're the only two generation Second generation. Second president. generation um, combination to have ever both been president. Yeah, yeah, I'm pretty proud of that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. You should be. And there's so much to tell in this memoir as to how Hawk got there. Um, I do want to turn a little bit to making films because you you have a fair amount of experience Couple. with that. <laughs> um, without you know giving away all the secret sauce, what ingredients do you think? Um, are required or needed for a great film? For a great film? A great film. Ah, uh, starts with story. <laughs> uh, a, a great producer named David Brown, Zanuck Brown produced Jaws, The Sting, The Verdict, and I could go on and on and on, and David was a brilliant, brilliant man. David said, uh, it's called Moving Pictures, and so, a a great movie, I think, is a moving experience. It could be moving in terror. It could be moving in a love story. It could be moving in, in a comedy. It can be moving in a drama or some other genre. But it has to be moving. And I think you have to care about the characters. I know we've gotten kind of quite a bit away from a lot of that with a lot of the franchises and the big action things. and. I know sometimes sitting in the trailers of, uh, before I go to see a movie, you know, the end of the world is coming and so-and-so saves him. And the next one is, the end of the world is coming and there's another, oh, and this one is a tidal wave. That's, so, um, but the ones that work, even of those, are the ones where w we relate to a character in that, in that, uh, in that story. So it all starts with story. And, and from there, uh, if you have a good story, you need a, a great screenwriter if it's not written yet. 
uh, to help you. And as a producer, you're hoping to hire a director and the rest of everybody else to have always the same vision that you have of why this particular motion picture should be, should be made. And uh, it's not easy, uh, especially now, because of streaming and, and everything else that, you know, I still, I believe in going to the movies. To me, it's magical. Hence, part of magic time is, I don't know about all of you out there, but I love going to have popcorn, sitting in a, in a theater and laughing with everybody else or being frightened with everybody else or just being on the edge of my seat uh, in a big screen. I, I don't want to in the middle of a, you know, I'm streaming a, a movie and all of a sudden, mom, can you come in? You know, I mean, talk about break the, you know. Sure, the spell. Yes. Absolutely. And you've, you've been on a few films where you know it's a hit. I mean, you, and not just you, like those that you're working with, you can see it, you can feel it. It's, it's a little bit more electric. Can you maybe pick out one of those instances or another one that maybe isn't included in the book where you just knew and, and how you knew or what, what was there for you? It's ethereal. I mean, I, I don't sure. know. I know that I was doing a film in Texas and a buddy of mine who was running Paramount called me and said, hey, can you come back and meet Lorne Michaels? Because, uh, you know, we want a Hollywood producer to produce Wayne's World with Lorne. And, uh, and I said, sure, I'll fly back. So I flew back from Texas. And just before I flew, I called my three kids. And I think my children at that time were like 22, 19, and like 12 or 13. And uh, I said, so Wayne's World, oh, dad, you got to do it, got to do it. Are you kidding? Wayne's World, greatest, greatest, greatest. And as, of course, we, my, my oldest son had just graduated Northwestern and he had been on sets his whole life. So he became the key set PA and we're, there, we're in rehearsal one day and I'm down in my office and he comes down. And he said, oh, dad, have you ever heard of Queen? And I, I said, yeah, Billy. He said, have you ever heard of Bohemian Rhapsody? And I went, yeah, Billy. He said, oh, my God, wait till you see what they're going to do in the pacer, right? And so there was this, Paramount didn't know. They thought Wayne's World was a, what they call a filler. Believe it or not, in those days, February 14th, Valentine's Day, was not a hot time to release a movie. So they thought, oh, it's going to be a filler. Well, we took the movie to preview in Wayne, New Jersey. Hey, that's a good idea for a movie called Wayne's World. <laughs> right there. And usually they, they do polling, like they do, you know, you can, at the end of the movie, the audience could put excellent, very good, good, fair, or poor. And you're hoping for excellence and very goods to be as high as you can get them. 75% is good, 80% is even better, 85 really great. And that's, you know, maybe 40% excellence and 40% very goods. Well, in Wayne, New Jersey, we had 98% excellent and two very good. And all of a sudden, Paramount went, wow, <laughs> we've got a hit here, right? So I don't know if I answered that part of the question, but all the way through, it was really fun. And I think Mike and Dana and and Penelope and, and uh, the Turners who wrote it, uh, they're genius. They had, they had their foot on the pulse of what was going on in the world at that time. And people still love watching Wayne's World. Oh, totally. I mean, it's a cult classic. <laughs> Party on. Um, absolutely. And talking about having a pulse on what's happening in the world, um, I love that you kind of reflected on these kind of pinnacle moments when it, during your career when there was something going on outside in the world that was much larger than you and much larger than the film industry um but it was it would it changed you you know in some way um and you reflected on that i believe in washington dc um with riots that were a result right after martin luther king was assassinated um i'd love it if you could Maybe talk a bit about that and also... Long Walk Home. I was going to say Long yeah. Walk Home. I'd love it if you could tell that story because I just feel like right. it was so I, momentous. I, I was thankfully part of a movie called The Long Walk Home that starred Sissy Spacek and Whoopi Goldberg. And it's the story of uh, what happened in Montgomery, Alabama after Rosa Parks. Uh, they started something called the Montgomery Bus Boycott where all of the uh, black maids... Uh, would not take the bus. They walked 
to the white neighborhoods. And what happened is um, a lot of the, the southern white bells didn't like that their housekeepers were coming late and having to leave a little early. And so they didn't tell their husbands, but they went and picked them up and had like carpools so they could get there on time. That was why the white women were doing it. But it's, it's a very powerful movie. I was re it didn't do much business, but I was very, very proud of this film. So a few days before filming, Whoopi, and it was her idea, and uh, I thought it was great, we all said, or Whoopi said, why don't we take the walk that they took in 1955? I think we made the movie in 1989. Uh, in 1955, why don't we take that walk? So Whoopi and I and some other cast members from the crew, a crew and cast, started that walk. And as we started to walk, it was like the Pied Piper. More and more people from the black neighborhood all started to walk with us. And then there were p other people who knew we were about to film down there. It's a small town. And by the time we got to the white neighborhoods, we had, I don't know, maybe three, 400 people with us. And it was really, it was a great kickoff to make a movie and there was, it was a great feeling of why we were making that film. It's such a beautiful moment that you describe, and each time it, it gives you a self-awareness about who you are. Well, there's another, if I can. Please. I was 19 years old working on that movie, This Property is Condemned, uh, and uh, before the cast and crew got down there, I was in what we call pre-production, and I had to go to the elementary school can I tell that story? Mm -hmm. I had to go to an elementary school and talk to the principal of this white elementary school and say that... Will I you mean, remind us of what year this is? This is 1965, Thank one you. year after the civil rights... So desegregation isn't really... The schools are still segregated. S schools, especially in, in right, the deep Alabama. south Mississippi. Right. And so I'm talking to the principal and I said, I need some kids talk to their parents and if they want to be extras background actors in the movie you know we'll take their names their phone numbers their addresses and then when wardrobe comes down here we'll get them fitted so that when we need kids they can just show up we'll put them in the wardrobe that's already been fitted for them and they'll be background actors and the principal of this elementary school looked at me and said uh, well mr Koch, none of my little white kids gonna play with no and i'm not gonna say the word n-word are they? And I said, well, no, sir. And I was a little scared. I was 19. And uh, he said, uh, I said, no, this movie takes place in 1931. And no, the black kids and the white kids won't play together. Then all of a sudden, he looked at the top of my head. Say, Mr. Koch, are you a Jew? And I just got the chills doing it again. And I mean, I was scared. And I said, uh, yeah, yes, I am. And he looked at the top of my head again, and he said, you know, I ain't never seen a Jew before up close. He was looking for horns. So that was my introduction to uh, racism and anti-Semitism at 19 years old, because I thought I knew a little bit about it, having studied in the Holocaust and everything else, but to see it firsthand and to be part of it. Um, I tell one more story. It's not in the book. Please. So when we're making the long walk home, a couple of my kids had come down for the 4th of July holiday, and the country club had invited us to come and watch the fireworks uh, at the country club. And my son, Robbie, who became friends with a couple of Whoopi's mm -hmm. cast kids, said, hey, Dad, can we bring, you know, Whoopi and all the, everybody from that family? And I went... Sure. <laughs> so I showed up at the country club with Whoopi and her husband in the movie, Ving Rhames, and yeah. Eric Alexander, a great actress, and the entire black family to watch the fireworks. And they all, because I was the producer, I was a big guy, and they couldn't really say anything. So I kind of <laughs> liked that. That's not in the book, but that's... Uh, that's a little bit of... Poetic justice, yeah. I think we should say. And I feel this just even as you can tell them years later with that emotion, it has to affect how oh, you make films absolutely. for sure. Are you done making films? Oh, I hope not. I hope not too. I hope not. I'm still trying. <laughs> still trying. 
anything you want to share with us? What's next? Uh, well, <laughs> there's a couple. One is called Arc of Justice, oh. which is a, uh, a National Book Award winner in, uh, I think, 2004 or five. True story of a, uh, a, a black doctor in Detroit uh, who, uh, through a bunch of circumstances, he and his wife and a whole bunch of them were arrested for murder because he moved to a white neighborhood. I know it's, it's I don't know why, but it's just long walk home in Ark of sure, Justice. Sure, sure. And then there's a, a pretty famous YA novel called uh, Staying Fat for Sarah Burns. <laughs> I don't know if, oh, some of you know it out there. Great. And uh, it's, it's a very powerful story about a couple of misfits that are outcasts in, in high school. And uh, I think it's very powerful. And I think, uh, I think we're going to get it made. Oh, that's and I'm going to do an updated uh, version of a movie I made in 1980 called The Idolmaker. Well, that is really interesting because I was going to ask what your opinion was of sequels or remakes of well, films. Um, Wayne's World 2 was nowhere near as good as Wayne's World. <laughs> uh, the Odd Couple 2 was terrible. <laughs> uh, most of them are not very good, and it's all about money. Uh, or the sequels and remakes... And I don't think you remake classics. I think you remake a movie that had a great story, but somehow it missed. And you have an idea of how to make that story that was so great better. That then make that. Like, I'm not doing remaking The Idolmaker about a movie about a, a 1960s music manager who found two kids, Frankie Avalon and Fabian. Uh, I, I'm doing an updated thing about something that happens today about a music, a guy who loves music, and I don't want to go into all of it because MGM will get very mad um, if I tell the story. Leave us wanting more. But yes, <laughs> yeah, right. So anyway, those are three of the things that I'm trying to get oh, made. That, that's that's really exciting, and I love hearing that because you, you know your track record's pretty good. So we want we want to thank you. We we definitely want to keep that there. All right. I want to totally change gears because you do share so much of your personal life in this book um, and all of its roller coaster dynamics, highs and lows. Um, and I thought it was really interesting because you made a pretty bold move when you turned 50. Hmm. And um, for those of you that don't know, as Hawk said, he was Howard. Koch Jr., and he decided to change his name at age 50, and he decided to become Bar Mitzvah. Right. Well, kind of, I got to go back a yes, little bit. But, but I'm, I'm setting the stage. Right. The rabbi said to you, wouldn't it be wonderful if you could see the panoramic of your life and the detail all at the same time? And I was struck by the irony as... At this point, as a producer and, and, and head of a, a you know major uh, production companies doing these incredible films, you have that role, but you didn't see that clarity in your personal life. Right, as you heard earlier, I was, I was Howard W. Koch Jr. And any time I met somebody, uh, they would say, "Oh, you must be so proud. You have the most wonderful dad. Uh, I love your dad, and oh, he helped me, and blah 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 blah. And uh, please say hi." And they never really talked to me. They talked about my father. And he deserved a lot of it. But I really wasn't as conscious of, you know, hey, I'm here too. And uh, at 49 years old, another relationship that I had been in broke up. I'd been in a few, had a couple of marriages, three kids. And um, I went and talked to a good Catholic friend of mine, and I said, i got to do something spiritual for my 50th birthday. And he said, well, I've been to your children's bar and bat mitzvahs. Can you get bar mitzvahed at 50? And I said, well, I, I don't know. Wow, what a great idea. That would be terrific to do. Let me go find out. And so he, uh, I found a rabbi who I fell in love with, and we sat for about a half hour, and he said to me, uh, uh, well, who are you? And I said, oh, I'm a movie producer. <laughs> I know who I am. And he said, well, no, 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 who are you? And I said, oh, well, I'm a father and I'm a son. Is, is that okay? Is that, that who I am? And then he said, who are you? And I didn't, I, I didn't know how to answer. And for some reason, out of my mouth came, I'm a Jewish man. And he said, that's a start. 
And I went, oh, I'm in trouble with this guy. He's, he's going to find out. And he said, what's your Hebrew name? And I said, my parents are non-religious. I don't have a Hebrew name. And he said, well, for your 50th birthday, for your bar mitzvah, you will be given your own name. Well, I broke down. And I just got so emotional. And he said, what is it? And I said, well, I just realized for 49 years I've had my father's name. Can I have my own name? I want my own name. And then the rabbi said the words that changed my life forever. He said, you can have your own name. What? A rabbi told me I could have my own name. And he said, do you want to be known as Jennifer or Harry or Frank or Joe or Bob or no? And he, and he said, well, did you ever have a nickname? And I said, well, my initials were HWK. And so I wrote them on my school books. And a few people called me Hawk, but it didn't really stick. He said, you know anything about hawks? And I said, yeah, bird of prey. <laughs> Not real good at that. And he said, well, hawks mate for life. And I went, well, that's something I was trying to do, but wasn't working. And he said, they also can see from horizon to horizon. Uh, and they can see a rabbit a half a mile away. And he said, wouldn't it be great if you could see the panoramic of your life and the detail always at the same time? And I thought, wow, yeah, I probably do do that unconsciously as a producer, but I certainly didn't do it in my personal life. And I thought, well, but isn't Hawk a pretentious name? And he said, it's only pretentious if you allow it to be. And so I went away uh, for a week up to, actually to Colorado, and I, uh, I was walking around trying to figure out if at 50 years old I could change my name. I had friends, I had ex-wives, I had children. Oh, here he is again. What's he doing this time? <laughs> right? And I came across a, uh, a Native American who was selling trinkets. And I looked at this trinket, and it's a, for those of you who can't see it, it's a, it's a cloud, it's a uh, lightning bolt, and it's the word listen. And uh, I said, what does it mean? And he said, do you know the way we are awake and aware and attuned between the lightning and the thunder? We hear it, we see it, we taste it, we feel it, we touch it. Wouldn't it be great if you could be that awake and aware and attuned all the time in your life, not just between the lightning and the thunder? And I thought, wow, how smart was this guy? And also, that was the A to put with my initials, HWK. And so I came home and took the name at my bar mitzvah and my birthday, the name Hawk Koch. And that's when I started meeting people. Instead of talking about my dad, they'd say, wow, what a cool name, or what kind of a weird name is that, or how'd you get that name? But they talked to me. So I called my good Catholic friend, Gary, and I said, hey, Gary, he sa I said, I, I took your advice. I'm getting bar mitzvah. And he said, oh, great. I said, yeah, and I'm changing my name. And he said, you're doing what? <laughs> I said, I'm changing my name. You're changing your name to what? Hawk. Hawk. <laughs> Hawk. What? Oh, my God. What did I do? <laughs> oh, I love that story from start to finish. This audience may find this particularly of interest. Hawk. Um, through a series of events began to start really affecting change within the industry, um, working with the Producer Guild of America, um, becoming one of their uh, co-presidents, I believe, at that time, and then Board of Governors representation for that branch with the Academy uh, of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences but then eventually became president. Um, and you can read all of that in the memoir, but what I loved was one of the first things you did, and you had a very short amount of time. You were finishing out a term, basically. Right, you so I termed out. I after one year the, right. to be president of the academy, so that's huge. And you had a, a list and really got things done, but what I thought was really interesting, they went from paper ballots to digital voting. Could you share a little bit about that, you know, what the challenges were? And well, it, it, the time was right. Sure. And so I wanted to do it, and a bunch of us at the, at the Academy wanted to do it. So we put it together, and we, for nominations, we sent out both paper ballots to people who wanted them and digital ballots. Because a lot of people in the industry, they don't just sit around in Hollywood waiting for the mail. They're working all over the world, and if you get a digital ballot, you can vote for the Oscars. A lot of people didn't know that 
a lot of the Oscars were voted on by a very few amount of people, which I thought was very sad. I wanted everybody to vote for every award. And not nominate, but vote. The nominations are nominated by each branch. Sound nominates sound awards. Actors nominate actors. But for the, for the finals, everybody gets to vote. So uh, it went terribly. We had a phone bank of people calling, and I can't do this, and I can't do that. And I, I, was, I was getting so many phone calls, they hated me. And they hated having to try and vote digitally. And uh, I, I was about to give up, and I called a good friend of mine, a guy named Phil Alden Robinson, who wrote and directed Field of Dreams, amongst a lot of other things. And he was a, he was a vice president while I was president. And I said, Phil, I don't know, maybe we just go back to paper ballots. He said, no, 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 you can figure it out. You find, find a way. And then I thought, oh, you know, I had met a guy named Craig Shermer who had worked in the, uh, for the 08 Obama campaign. Mm -hmm. And he had been part of doing all the phone banks and all the phone calling for the Obama campaign. So I called Craig up. He was coming back from a trip to Sweden or something. And I said, I need your help. And he came in and he had a meeting with us, literally landed at like midnight from Sweden and at nine o'clock in the morning, he's at the academy talking to us. Well, he turned it around and I gotta give him full credit. But by the time we did the finals, everybody said, why do we have any paper ballots at all? <laughs> and now today, I don't know the exact percentage, but I, it's well over 90% of all academy members vote. And I think that's great. And wherever you are in the world, you get to vote. And therefore, it is a real, as you know, and hopefully everybody out there knows, the one thing we get to do in this country that a lot of people don't get to do is vote. And I hope everybody will vote in the 2020 election. And I hope all Academy members that are watching will vote for the Oscars this year coming up. No, absolutely. And by the way, that is 2012. So that was that was the the 2013 Oscars. 2013 Oscars, yeah, but it was yeah. 2012, 2013 when yes. So mm -hmm. you know it was time, as as Hawk said. Do we have a question? Yes. Uh, so thanks once again for uh, coming today. Um, now that you've solved the blight of paper ballots, uh, what do you think are the largest issues kind of facing the industry uh, for the next five, ten years? Oh, uh, streaming. <laughs> Stream. Uh, you know what's what's going to happen? It's. I'm sure that question might have been asked in 1951 by somebody said, now that there's television, what's going to happen to movies? Mm. You know, or maybe uh, in the 19, uh, what, late 70s, now that there's VHS or now that there's DVDs, I don't know the answer to streaming because it's a whole new world. I know that I don't know a 16-year-old who wants to sit downstairs in their house with their parents in the next room with their girlfriend watching a movie. I think they want to go to the movies or they want to get out of the house. I mean, maybe they'll watch it on their phone, but I still believe that movies are something that people want to go see. And I'm kind of happy this year that so many films are original ideas, not just franchises, not just sequels. So, and people are going to see them. You know, last year it was, you know, somebody, somebody said yes to Crazy Rich Asians. Oh, you're, nobody's ever going to make a movie, you know, about Asians and in Singapore. And who's ever going to say, well, $200 million later, just in the United States alone. So I don't know what's going to happen. I don't think all the streaming services are going to be able to be in business five years from now. And I think movie theaters are still going to be there. I think it might be different in movie theaters. But I believe the Oscars should be given for theatrical motion pictures. Let streaming give their own awards. I want, I want the Oscars. I think the Oscars is the gold standard, and it is for movies you could see in a movie theater. And I believe that some some companies are uh, gaming the system because they know that if the movie plays for one week, and then we can put it on our streaming service, oh well, then it's eligible for an Oscar. Yes, it is, and at the moment, and they know me, and they know that I'm against that. <laughs> because I want, when a movie's nominated for an Oscar, I don't want the audiences to go, oh, I can stream it, right? I want them to go to a movie theater with all their friends and laugh or 
be scared or whatever it is. I want them to have that communal experience. I think it started a long time ago, a real long time ago when we created fire and we sat around a campfire in, you know, how many thousands of years ago and we told stories, you know, and we got out. So I don't know if that answered your question, but that's kind of that's kind of how I feel. Yes, sir. I'll actually, that was Gentleman actually a, with a Google uh, T-shirt. <laughs> I'll actually use that as a great segue to mine. Uh, I actually live in the Culver City area where they're doing all this construction now for all the these uh, the streaming studios that are trying to expand aggressively. Uh, from my perception, it seems like they're trying to build up to look more like the bigger studios that only release out into the theaters instead of only being perceived as these sort of streaming platforms. Um, like, does, does for you, does it seem like, are you convinced that they're going to move into the theaters as well? Or uh, does it just seem like they're, they're going to be streaming and just continue to do that one week in the theater, sort of? I, a, I have no idea. <laughs> right. <hi>. But B, <laughs> so you understand, I am in this industry. So I love all these streaming services because there's so much content that needs to be made that I'm thrilled for everybody. Actors, writers, directors, cinematographers, production designers, sound technicians, grips, electricians, all the way down to craft service, right? Sweeping the floor. I'm thrilled, so that, don't get me wrong. I don't, I, I'm not against streaming services. No. <laughs> I think streamers will probably put all their movies on streaming until there's one that they think is so good that wow, this one maybe could win an Oscar. And I think that put, they'll put that one in the movie theaters and maybe they'll do it the same way that Disney and Universal and Warners and Paramount and all the others do it. But that's, I'm hoping at some point that the, the Academy will change the rules so that they can't game the system, so that the Oscar remains for a theatrical motion picture. And therefore, I think those streaming services who are gonna make a lot of money, some of them will, and some of them already are, will continue to make movies and the ones that are really good, they'll put in theaters and do it the same way everybody else does. That answers the question? Yeah, thank you. Good. Another question? Anyone else? Oh, come on, don't be afraid. <laughs> there you go. That's, I, that's what I always, I always feel that way. People are, we need cur more courage in our lives. <laughs> Don't be afraid to ask any. <laughs> I actually have a movie-related question. Um, what was it like working with Olivier on uh, Marathon Man? Well, it's, there's a great story in that. Um, we have something called cast insurance, where every, all the major actors and the director have to be insured, and we pay insurance for it because, God forbid, an actor gets sick and can't work, the director is in a car accident, something happens to the film, and we can't finish the movie, we have insurance. Well, Laurence Olivier could not be insured at that time when we were making Marathon Man because he had had cancer. And the insurance companies would not insure him. And Robert Evans, who was the producer of that movie, said, I don't care, Sir Laurence Olivier is gonna be in this movie and he was able to talk the studio into going without cast insurance. And when Sir Lawrence showed up on the set his first day of shooting, he was kind of like a balloon that was maybe had 10% of the air in it because he hadn't worked and he hadn't, and like all the rest of you, I'm sure you do what you love. I do what I love. And he hadn't been able to do what he loved. But when he came on the set, the director, John Schlesinger, started to talk to him. And then the, the prop man came up and said, uh, uh, Mr. Olivier, which watch would you like to be wearing for this character? And the wardrobe person said, do you want to be holding your coat or do you want to be wearing it? And you could start to see that, oh, this was, and then he did a take, you know, and then he did a second take. And the script supervisor said, uh, in the last take you, you had your whatever. And he started to come alive. And as days and days went on, he became more and more the Sir Lawrence Olivier, the actor that we had all loved. And when we got back to LA, we were shooting in New York, and we got back to LA, and I was an assistant director, and I was exhausted at the end of the day. And he, he, uh, he came over to me, he said, hey, what are you doing tonight? 
And I said, I'm going home. I'm tired. Aren't you going home? We just worked all day. He said, no, no. Natalie and RJ invited me over. The, they're giving me a dinner party. Have fun. And I was thinking, wow. By doing that movie, he went on and did like five or six movies in a row right after that before he got too sick to, to continue. But I thought, what a great thing Bob Evans did. And what a great thing to be able to watch someone get to do what they love. So thank you for that question. There's also that famous story. My yes, yes. My husband, who loves films, actually said, you know, well, you know, with Marathon Man, there's this, you know, folk legend uh, about a conversation that Dustin Hoffman and Sir Lawrence Olivier had. Do you want to share yes, that? Yes, yes. Um, <laughs> because you witnessed it. Yes, I actually saw it. Uh, <laughs> Dustin is a method actor and uh, sometimes can be difficult. Other times he can be great, and he's a great actor. And uh, in the movie Marathon Man, he, he plays a guy who has been um, basically tortured by Olivier. In fact, uh, there's a famous line. Uh, he, start, he has Dustin tied up and uh, has a drill and is drilling his teeth, trying to get an answer to a question that Sir Lawrence Olivier wants answered. And he keeps saying to Dustin, is it safe? Is it safe? And when Dustin doesn't give the answer, he drills his teeth. So this is now, at the end of the movie, the climax of the film. His teeth have been drilled. He hasn't been sleeping for three or four days in the movie. So Dustin is staying up, doing whatever he can to be method acting that he's exhausted and everything else. And it's the climactic scene of the movie and there's this big tete-a-tete -tete between Dustin and Olivier. And Dustin keeps blowing take after take after take. And not only are we all getting upset and John Schlesinger is getting upset, Olivier is getting upset because he wants to finish the goddamn scene. <laughs> and he finally said to Dustin after like the take 14 or something, Dustin, why don't you just try acting? Well, the whole set got quiet, and everybody was like, whoa. And Dustin got the message, and the next take, boom, he got it. And so that's the famous story that I actually saw. I love it. I love it. I would love to talk about one of the photos that's up here, because as I was telling you, um, before we started today, um, Warren Beatty may be my first crush. When I was nine years old, I saw Heaven Can Wait. Um, and I just think it's amazing that you shot a scene in the middle of an NFL game. So would you tell us a little bit about kind of what a crazy um, challenge that you take on sometimes and, and tell us that story from Heaven Can Wait. Well, um, I love sports and obviously I'm an organizer. so. I had worked with Warren on a movie called The Parallax View, and he had tried to get me on shampoo, but I was doing, I think, Chinatown at the time. And uh, he called me one day and said, would you meet me? And I met with him, and he told me a little bit about this movie he was going to make called Heaven Can Wait. And uh, he knew it was based on uh, a movie called Here Comes Mr. Jordan, which I knew very well, and read the script. And he said, how would you do the Super Bowl? And I told him how I do the Super Bowl, because the end, the climax of the movie is that the Rams, and specifically Warren Beatty, as the quarterback of the Rams, is going to win the Super Bowl. And so uh, we went to, what I said, we went to the NFL and got their permission, the National Football League. We had to go to the Rams and we had to go to the Pittsburgh Steelers, because they were going to play an exhibition night game. And what I was hoping is that halftime of that game, while the, all of the, those guys ran off the field, both teams, the referees, the down marker guys, everybody would run off the field, I would have prepared a, an entire football team of the Rams and the Steelers, of our, our actors, our football players, <laughs> referees, sidelines, everybody. And we would have 14 minutes and six cameras to shoot the the climactic scene, and we had to have rehearsed it, and everybody had to know exactly what they were doing. And we got ready to do it. And during the lead up to this night, I kept talking to, I think his, he was, I think his title was the general manager of the Los Angeles Rams. His name was Jack Teal. And he said, now you're going to give me a good halftime, aren't you? 
And I said, oh, yeah, we're going to win the Super Bowl. Half day. Oh, yeah, make sure you give us a good halftime. Well, halftime usually was a, a local high school band, you know, but he was adamant. Give me a good, and he kept calling me all the time. And it's the night of the shoot, and we're getting ready. You know, it's the first quarter, and comes down to me on, I'm down on the field getting ready to do everything. You're going to give me a good halftime show, aren't you? And said, yeah, right. So, and Warren, who is very controlling and likes to control everything, he was directing that movie as well, couldn't control this because he had to be in the scene. It's a scene like the Immaculate Reception where the ball hits somebody, it comes back into Warren's hands and he runs 50 yards for the touchdown that wins the game. So we had him do it time and time again during this 14 minutes. It came off fantastic. We got to do a whole bunch of other shots in those 14 minutes. It was fabulous. We got amazing footage. Everything's great. And when the real Rams went off the field for halftime, I had the announcer say, don't go away, fans, because tonight at halftime, the Rams are going to win the Super Bowl. Well, everybody in the 50,000 fans, they were cheering. You know, it was great. And we had all these old football players who had played for the Rams, Jack Snow and Deacon Jones and Merlin Olson and Fred Dreyer, all these guys. So the announcer kept announcing who these guys are as we did our scene. So we got it. We're great. It's now we're exhausted. We're going to do some shooting after everybody leaves, do some filming. We don't do shooting, <laughs> do filming after the end of the game. And Jack Teal comes down on the field and I went, hey, Jack, how about that, huh? And he said, how about it, it was the worst halftime we've ever had. And I said, what, are you kidding? The fans were cheering. It was the, he said, nobody went out and bought hot dogs. It was the worst conceptions. <laughs> You win some, you lose some, and some are rained out, guys. <laughs> so good. All right. Well, this is um, brings it all back together. You have a mantra that you use um, a lot in the book, magic time. Right. Um, what does it mean to you, and how did uh, you come to adopt this? Well, uh, as you heard, I was on a movie set for a long time, and being on a movie set for me is magical. I wish I could be one on today. I wish I was producing a movie right now. Um, it's always been magical to me. It's a f it's, I have my family at home and the movie families. Going to a movie theater is magical for me, as I've mentioned before. I love being in a movie theater, seeing, seeing that magic up on the screen. And then the third thing is, in 1982, Jack Lemmon, a uh, great actor, several Oscars, made a movie called uh, Days of Wine and Roses, in which he played an alcoholic. And before he took a drink, he'd go, magic time. And he took a drink. And Jack absconded with that mantra for, for when he was in front of a camera. I got to do two movies with Jack. One was called The Odd Couple, with Jack Lemmon and Walter Matthau. And before every take, if he was off not thinking about his role and his character. Somebody was talking to him, hey, Jack, are you going to have lunch today with me? Can I have lunch? And you'd, and you'd hear roll camera. He'd go, magic time. And he would focus on his, on, on his character, and he'd get into character immediately. So I took that. I didn't say it out loud, but I was behind the camera all these years when we said, you know, roll camera, I went magic time to myself and thought to myself, what's my role in this? What do I have to concentrate on? What do I have to be watching for when I'm making a film? And so just before I went out in front of 1.3 billion people in front of the Oscars, standing off stage, just as I was being introduced, I said to myself, magic time. And I got out there and I actually didn't fall down. <laughs> I stood up and it, I got a lot of energy and approval because in the audience I saw so many people that I had worked with before and they were smiling and they were giving me support. And so it was a, it was a great moment for me and hence I guess that's why I had the thumbs up. No, so great and I hope our engineers will, you know, when they're coding to launch, you know, you can maybe utter to yourself, magic. <laughs> thank you so much thank for you. joining us. Thank you. You're a terrific interviewer, Jennifer. Well, thank you. Really appreciate it. Thank, thank you, you everybody.